Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. This is the valley, a vanished world from a forgotten time. Here on the Welsh borders, a farm is being run by five hand-picked experts, as it would have been nearly 400 years ago. Using only resources available in the year 1620, they are laboring for a full calendar year, turning the clock back to rediscover a way of life from an age gone by. It's March and our seventh month here in the farm. It's coming up to that next great landmark in the agricultural calendar, the spring sowing. And 400 years ago, just like us, they'd have been spending a great deal of time and effort preparing the soil. Here in the garden, there's an enormous amount to be done. And also out in Triangle Field, um, where we're trying to take a, a piece of land back from waste into agricultural use. Indoors as well, it's the time of year for making March beer. And I know that we need another batch of grain prepared, ready to take to the miller, otherwise we're going to run out of bread. <laughs> 400 years ago, bread truly was the staple of life. But making it was a slow, hard task. The first stage of turning wheat into bread flour is threshing. This means Alex and Fonz have to literally beat the grains out. Yeah, that should do. OK, let's give it a hiding, Fonz. OK. Well, 400 years ago, these things were used for the beating the wheat and giving it a, a damn good hiding. Instead of just beating it with a stick, the idea is here that the hinge in the middle means that you can thresh in a much smaller area. The other benefit of the hinge is so that the top part of the flail strikes the wheat flat and therefore knock out more seeds of grain. Now it's something you do intermittently. You wouldn't do it all in one go because grain keeps better in this form than it does as flour. With the weather warming up in March, Stuart needs to get out in the garden and start a major overhaul. Now, 400 years ago, this was the really heavy time for work in the garden. You haven't got rotavators or any of the modern equipment for a garden this size. So it's the one time that the men are brought into the garden to break the back of the heavy work of digging. <sighs> Rest of the year, sowing and weeding and harvesting that well, can all be handled by the women. It's nice, lightweight work. Last year, this was the cabbage and kale and other brassicas bed. This year, we're going to be planting root vegetables, so beetroot, carrots, onions, parsnips, turnips. And by changing the type of crop each year, you prevent the build-up of diseases in the soil. Those things that like cabbage are going to be a bit confused when they try and bite an onion. It's also time to prepare another of the key dietary staples of the 17th century, beer. Ruth and Chloe are making up one of the particularly strong period varieties, March beer. You want to check that water? Brewing is one of those processes that just has to happen again and again and again through the year. It's our main drink. It's not just for getting drunk in the evenings. Although it wasn't the Industrial Revolution yet. That didn't mean we wasn't any industry. There was loads of industry. Paper mills, tanners, dyers, all sighted along streams and rivers, using that water and dumping their effluent into it. So unless you actually had a spring, then your water could be pretty dodgy. And beer is safe to drink. The water's ready up to temperature now. Oh, want... lovely. Do you want to put some of the malt in? Yeah, what, do you want a third of it? Yeah, I think About... so. The main ingredient, malt, is germinated barley, usually supplied by a professional maltster. Last one. It's lovely. 
After several hours of beating, Alex and Fons can pause to examine the precious fruit of their labor. We'll just clear some of this out of the way and... Oh, look at that. It must be about, must be near on an inch thick, actually, on top of this, this blanket. In the well house, the mixture of malt and hot water is mashing down well. Oh, it smells wonderful. I love this. It's like Ovaltine. It's really nice. People in the 17th century drank huge amounts of beer, really, by modern standards, up to eight pints a day. But that was the weak beer, the low alcohol beer. Um, it was a really important part of people's diet. It contains lots of minerals and vitamins and quite a lot of carbohydrates, so it's quite an important element in the diet itself. And in fact, the temperance movement in the 19th century actually caused major malnutrition amongst the rural poor when people were encouraged to switch from drinking beer to drinking tea. This is the first stage of the brewing. It's called mashing. The hot water which we're pouring onto the malted grain releases enzymes which help to break down the coat of the grain, basically, and release the starch and starts the fermenting process. Want to give me a hand putting that lid on? Yeah. Ready? One, two, three. OK. okay. Yeah, lovely. Outdoors, Stuart and his son Alistair are sowing Martok field beans, a very rare variety like a small, broad bean, which used to be grown centuries ago. It's important to get these in early, so March is an ideal time, because then there's less chance that we'll get black fly building up on them. And at the period, of course, there were no insecticides that you could spray on as we can now to rectify a problem. So get them in early while the frost's still working for you. They're pretty hardy. If you relied on the natural predators, things like ladybirds, they would actually keep the worst of the pest burden down. But at the upper classes, when they were growing flower gardens and it was important to them, then they did have some chemicals they used. We found one referred to called orpiment. And after some considerable research, we discovered this was arsenic trisulfide. So you certainly want to wash your cabbages if it's coming out of an upper crust garden. But round here, all you've got to do is watch out for the ladybirds between your teeth. At the end of a hard day, the team decide to have a bit of fun, playing some of the indoor games that were popular back in the age of the Stuarts. If you get your chance, you get the pot. OK, and my chance seven. is if you, a seven. seven. If he blows it, do you three all split the pot? Yes. Right. OK, so I've got to get seven. <laughs> I hate to tell you this, but it's actually a seven. No! no. Oh, it can't be! The There's lots high. of dice games, not just this one. Though this is a fairly dangerous one. You can lose everything on this game. Hazard is by name and hazard by nature. There's a marvellous book that was um, done by a chap called Sturt back in, um, well, beginning of the 19th century, actually. But he collected together all these old games and the references and proof of what was played when. Um, there's a really great quote, actually, from, like, grab it. This art is the mother of lies, of perjuries, of theft, of debate, of injuries, of manslaughter. The very invention of the devils of hell. <laughs> and actually, I think it must be, it's fairly accurate, because if you read some of the coroner's record, records of, um, you know, all suspicious deaths, um, fights in alehouses over alcohol that involve gambling are quite common. <laughs> As it is, I'm already mucking out tomorrow. Yeah. The consequence yeah. of my losing streak. <laughs> so I'll go in three. You know, I'm, got nothing to... I'm only right. got two. It's I'm going there. six. Oh. Here we go. So what do I need? Six. We want a six. We want a six. You, you can't get an eight, that's for sure. No. I've got an eight. That's a three. Oh, and that is a five. No. Oh. You winner. <laughs> Read it and weep, Fonzie. Read it and weep. You're all mucking out anyway. Yep. <laughs> I can live with mucking out. A new March morning, and Alex and Fons are going to try and process the threshed grain. They need to separate the grains of wheat from their shells, the chaff. Yep. Technique we're going to use here is something called a winnowing basket. And you can see what's happening here is 
I'm spilling a lot of grain. Yeah, but that's fine because we're spilling it back onto our, our blankets, that's not to worry. And the idea here really is, yeah, is to kind of throw it up in the air and rely on the wind to then blow the chaff. How's it coming on? Chaff's all on top of the grain. Yeah. I need the wind to blow it off. Could it be your technique, Pond? We've also got a separation here, haven't we? Yep. So I could take that off now. See that? All the chaff just sitting on the top there. In the wellhouse, Ruth and Chloe need to press on with the March beer. It takes at least a month to brew. They've strained out the malt, so the next step is to add the hops, which give beer its bitter taste, in contrast to the period sweet ale. The hops act as a preservative, so if you make beer, it'll keep for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, months even. But if you make ale, it really only keeps for sort of a fortnight at most. Mm. That smells a bit different. It does, doesn't it? It changes it quite, quite quickly. Mm. At this point, it's still sort of a, there's still a sort of divide, really, between ale, which is being largely made by women at home domestically, in small batches using small tubs, small barrels, and beer, which is being largely, but not exclusively, um, brewed by men on a commercial basis. The hops now need to boil for an hour. Then yeast is added before it's decanted into barrels to ferment. Out in the spring sunshine, the winnowing is going well. Hours of practice is starting to make Fonz's technique look almost perfect. It's a replica of baskets of the period. And it's obviously got one side to it that flattens off at the far end, allowing you to catch it up here and swirl it round but also allowing the chaff to float out of the end. We'd seen depictions of these in, in um, paintings from the period. It was really just a case of honing our technique, and, and we've, we tried the basket the other way round, and, and also trying to, just trying to swirl it round and flick it up, swirl it round and flick it up was the difficult thing, without throwing it all over the farmyard. Yep. You're happy with that, yeah? It's all grain, yeah. OK. Wonderful. This month sees some new additions to the valley. As was common in spring, they've bought in some piglets, specially bred wild boar Tamworth crosses, the closest type to the pigs of the era. These are brought as weaners when they're just old enough to leave their mother at a few months old. And not every farm would have kept a sow over winter. It was an extra expense. For the next few months, they're going to be fattening themselves up through the summer, converting all our waste into usable meat for the autumn. But in the short term, we're going to make even more use of them by sending them down to Triangle Field, where they'll root up all the bramble roots, rip out the bracken, trample the young bracken as it tries to appear. And not only are they going to help clear the ground, but all the dung that's coming out of the back end is going to add to the soil fertility there, which has been taking a lot of effort from us over the last uh, few weeks. For Ruth and Chloe, it's time for a journey with Blackthorn. They're off to the mill with Alex and Fonzie's freshly winnowed grain. Without a cart, they're using a traditional pack saddle. Some people use little hand mills or kern stones for grinding small amounts of flour, hence the expression, the daily grind. But most would have saved their grain for a trip to the miller. Bit more that way, bit more. Oh, steady, steady. Don't look up the sun. Pick it up. Yep. There you go. Cool. Thanks, right, guys. Okay. We'll see you guys later. Yeah. Have fun. Do you, you want to grab the hay net? Yeah. Give you something to chomp on, madam. Over at the pigsty, it's time for the piglets to earn their keep by foraging in Triangle Field. The boys have made some pig yolks, which were used 400 years ago. Unfortunately, no one knows exactly what these yolks look like. <laughs> round one to the pigs. Round two. Go on, Fonzie. 
Kevin. Hold it really well. From the period texts on farming, we know that they used yokes. The pigs would often be running free, uh, free around the yards, and if they found a hedge, because it's a woodland animal, it's shaped like a torpedo, it just squeezes through any gap. But they just really, really scream. You just gotta try and ignore it. <laughs> Pigs always scream a lot when you handle them. It's uh, just the way they are, but they actually get far less stressed than animals like young lambs, where you've got to be fairly short on the time you're actually handling them before they start to palpitate a lot. These things are built like tanks. Nearly there, little fella. No, that's a very healthy pig making a, a fairly standard pig noise. The idea here is to prevent the pig from burrowing underneath the hedges, the dead hedges that we've made, and getting out of pens. It's got the two forks there, so when it gets its head down, it can't properly get under. And ideally, this one on top as well stops it getting through bars. But we don't know yet. We're just experimenting, and, and hopefully they'll work. It really is uh, It's quite a battle to get these things on. Number two? <sighs> I suppose so, number two. <laughs> To mill their grain, Ruth and Chloe have come to the Museum of Welsh Life, where a working water mill, similar to those of the period, is still in operation. Go on, you go in. OK. Resident milling expert Geraint Thomas is going to turn our team's threshed grain into flour. The first process, you tie the sack off to this chain, and this is pull up the very top of the mill then to start the milling process. They weigh about 112 pounds each or 50 kilos, and although the water wheel is lifting it, you've got to really pull down this rope to get that sack to the top floor, you know? In Triangle Field, an area of waste ground is being made ready for the spring pea crop. But there are still masses of bracken roots clogging the soil. Come on. Hungry piglets should provide the solution. Come on. Unfortunately, there's been a problem with the yolks. 400 years ago, we know they had yolks for pigs. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly what those yolks look like. So the yolks we put on were purely an experiment. Unfortunately, it didn't work. They fell off. So we're just going to trust the pigs will be happy with the food, and that will keep them contained. We'll go back to the old traditional swine herd angle. We can have somebody up there just keeping an eye on them, make sure they don't wander off into one of the pastures and start destroying the grassland. All right. But well, they're happy. The workings of a watermill are based on gravity. So with the valley's wheat now up on the top floor, it can begin its journey down to the water-powered millstones where it will be ground into bread flour. The diet of a family of the 1600s would be markedly different to now. Generally speaking, they eat a lot more bread as a bulk. Since Norman times, flour mills were a key source of government revenue. Tax was levied on every sack of grain that was milled. In the year 1400, there was a Welsh leader called Owen Glyndwr. Some people know him as Owen Glyndwr. The first thing he did was he destroyed the English mills, knowing that this would sever the income 
of the English landowners. Once ground out by the millstones, the flour trickles down into hoppers below. I love the way it's going in so quickly and it came out so slowly. <laughs> He's got a really nice, fine grind on this, hasn't he? It's quite nice to know we're really using our own flour this time. It's, it's, it's a very sort of rewarding feeling. It's the most enormous amount of labour and thought and effort's gone into it just to produce something that is, you know, so basic, really, a sort of staple of life. So then you can just about make out the, the wheat coming through, just bouncing off my fingers now, going inside the stones. It goes into the eye of the top stone that's turning. The lower stone isn't turning at all. But the gap between the stone tapers as it goes out towards the edges. So the flower then is sent out centrifugally, right to the edges, which then drops downstairs as wholemeal flour. Milling may seem slow by modern standards, but compared to doing it by hand, mills were a vital labor-saving device. I could produce I don't know, some, some 200 kilos in a day. When I was using a hand quern, it would take me about an hour to get enough flour for one loaf. This is roughly 33 times faster. People often imagine that, you know, the sort of heavy lifting of sacks and things and going off to the mill must have been man's work. But um, women did quite a lot of heavy labor too. And most marketing, you know, sort of buying and selling on a sort of daily domestic basis was in England and Wales usually done by women. Um, foreigners thought it was really, really unusual. You know, on the continent, women just didn't have that amount of freedom. Next morning, and Stuart is making an early start on the cooking. The team are still in the middle of Lent, so, like their ancestors 400 years ago, they are avoiding meat. So today's meal is based around fish, and we've got some salt cod here, an egg and pear pie, with the last of the nice soft pears for the end of the winter, and the few vegetables we can find out in the garden. So we've got some leeks, some onions we've had in store, and there's still a few herbs out there that are hanging on. I'm also going to be using a chafing dish, essentially a charcoal brazier with holes in the bottom. The ash can fall down and the air can pass up. And to light this, I need some red hot coals out of the fire just to get it started. Chafing dishes were a common 17th century cooking device, perfect for gently simmering fish. Salt cod was a durable, lightweight food that could be moved easily up to the hill farms and was very readily and cheaply available at the west coast ports particularly. On the east coast it was more herring, but <sighs> this would have come across from places like Bristol. <sighs> Tough as old boots though. Now I need to cook this in verjuice which is a crab apple vinegar. So it doesn't just taste acid like normal vinegar, but it's got that dryness if you've ever bitten into a crab apple. And it uh, gives it a real bit of zing. There we go. And on she goes to simmer. And that'll take an hour or two just cooking very, very gently. I'll just sprinkle these over the top. And there we go. Leave that to warm up. The next dish I've got to prepare is the egg and pear pie. <laughs> So these are the last of the black Worcesters. They won't keep much longer. And these have got to be soaked in beer, which, as you can imagine, is going to improve the flavor nicely. We're following a recipe that dates back to around 1600. And it's somewhat unusual to modern ears because it involves putting in a mixture of sweet things, pears, with uh, savoury things, in this case, eggs. But it was quite common at the period to mix fruit and meat elements or savoury elements together. Uh, put some ale in. Being ale, you don't have the hot content you get in beer, so it's far less bitter. There we go, and we'll just let those marinate. Bringing animals into Triangle Field over the past few months has helped with rooting it up. But with April almost upon them, 
it's going to require some real muscle to accelerate the process. The next job is to quite literally dig deep and dig out the bracken roots, which are going down almost as far as the topsoil. Now, we've got some coming up here, you see. You can see the density of these things. In some places, it's coming up almost like a carpet. Every morning when I wake up, my shoulders are just so stiff. And it's a, a real effort to try and convince yourself to come back to Triangle Field. It is a relentless process, it really is. This is the first job that's kind of come close to actually breaking, breaking us, it really is. It's, it's just non-stop digging every day. Indoors, the salt cod is simmering nicely on the chafing dish. The next thing I need to do is to get these hard-boiled egg yolks out of the eggs. And in midwinter, we wouldn't have been able to do this recipe because the chickens shut down for about three months and stopped laying, but uh, they started up again a couple of weeks back. To make the egg and pear pie mix, the egg yolks need a quick grind in the mortar. Then a splash of cream is added, along with a few crunchy hazelnuts. This is mixed with the pears, along with a spoonful of honey, and then put over the fire to stew. In the dairy, the girls' March beer has been fermenting all month and is just about ready to drink. Now, the big stodge dish for today is what was known as Drusen's Pottage. The main ingredient is oatmeal. Now, this is coarsely ground oatmeal, so you can still see the grains in there. It's not like a modern porridge oat, which is crushed between massive steel rollers these days. Now, the second ingredient is absolutely free. It's the sludge from the bottom of the beer barrels that we're clearing out. And this is highly nutritious, as well as being cheap. It's all those wonderful B vitamins that they advertise on the back of a Marmite pack is exactly what you've got here. So all this is going to need is half an hour or so stewing on the fire. It's all been pretty physical this morning. <laughs> it's been fairly physical. Freshering, winnowing. I didn't think freshering and fleshing and fleshing. Yeah. <laughs> <Fresh -ing. laughs> How much of this beer have you had? <laughs> Too much. Right, get them while it's hot. Egg and pear pie. It's been a good month in the valley, with the vegetable garden sown, a triangle field ready for planting, and a batch of flour in store. The team can sit back and enjoy a well-earned sip of homemade extra strong beer. Especially with the look on your face. It's, it's, it's fishy. It's fishy <laughs> and very salty. Yeah. Right. Just as fish should be. It's a bit like <laughs> it's a bit like sort of fishy chewing gum. You know? <laughs> it doesn't matter how much you, you know chew what? it, it just won't go away. Oh, cheaper. Stuart, did, did I not tell you that that extra family weren't coming for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just keep chewing. <laughs> slowly rinsing the vinegar out of it. But no, it's, it's going to it. it's, no, it's, yeah, it's, no, it's, it's rough. <laughs> Meals like this, you can see why they look forward to spring. <laughs> For the valley experts, winter is finally behind them. Spring flowers, longer days, and a brighter season beckon. Lovely, Lovely. 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 Lovely.